Signs have been spotted that North Korea has started rebuilding guard posts that were destroyed under the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement days after it scrapped the military pact. Similar countermeasures are being taken by the South. D-1 until the announcement of which city will get to host the 2030 World Expo. We take a closer look at the voting process in Paris and what to look forward to. Following the release of 17 more hostages held by Hamas, there's a growing call from the international community to extend the four-day truce between Israel and the Palestinian militant group Hamas, which ends in the coming hours. It's November 27, 2023. This is New Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung-min. We start with growing tensions on the Korean Peninsula in the wake of North Korea's spy satellite launch last week. Pyongyang appears to be increasing its military activities near the inter-Korean border following its recent termination of the 2018 military agreement in response to Seoul's partial suspension of the pact. South Korea's military says its guard posts near the border are being restored. Our defense correspondent Che Min Jung begins our coverage. The South Korean military has detected that North Korea has recently been working to restore its guard post in the demilitarized zone right after it announced last week that it would restore all military measures and terminate the September 19th inter Korean military agreement. North Korea declared the complete abolition of the September 9th military agreement on November 23rd. And since November 24th, the regime has been implementing measures to restore its military activities. Pictures revealed by the military on Monday show that North Korea has dispatched soldiers and heavy weapons to restore its surveillance posts near the inter-Korean border. North Korean soldiers were also spotted on guard duty at night. Under the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement, North Korea destroyed 10 out of its 11 guard posts near the border as part of efforts to reduce tensions. However, restoration efforts are now being seen at all 11 guard posts. The military added that North Korea's provocations have worsened near the maritime border as well, as the number of opened coastal artillery gun ports has significantly increased. South Korea's defense ministry says the military will be fully prepared to immediately implement countermeasures. We clearly state that our military is closely monitoring North Korea's provocations and is fully prepared to punish North Korea immediately, strongly and to the end, based on Seoul and Washington's strengthened joint defense posture. Speaking to reporters on Monday, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Kim Myung-soo, hinted at the possibility of restoring South Korea's guard posts as a corresponding measure, saying that it comes down to how the, quote, enemy decides to act. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol also ordered the chiefs of the Defense Ministry and JCS to maintain a firm military readiness posture so that the citizens can feel secure. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. South Korean military officials say North Korea's recent military spy satellite is orbiting the Earth stably. The officials, however, said it's too soon to verify the satellite's reconnaissance capability. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim jong shil reports. A week has passed since Pyongyang launched a military reconnaissance satellite on the night of November 21st. On Monday, South Korea's Ministry of National Defense announced the results of an analysis of the spy satellite. North Korea's so-called military reconnaissance satellite is currently believed to have entered orbit. This launch poses a great threat to our national security as, based on its ICBM-based technology, it can be used to launch nuclear weapons. Military officials in Seoul also told reporters that the satellite is orbiting the Earth properly, but remained puzzled as to Pyongyang's claims that the satellite captured images of military bases in South Korea and the U.S. The officials added it usually takes months to verify the operational status of a satellite. Pyongyang's satellite launch led the U.N. Security Council to convene an emergency meeting in New York on Monday local time. Eight countries, including the U.S., the U.K., and Japan, are participating, as well as South Korea. Since the strategic value of North Korea has become very high, 
It might be difficult to get a meaningful resolution passed from the UNSC meeting, with China and Russia taking the North side, instead of blaming it. North Korea state-run KCNA cited a foreign ministry official on Monday who said the satellite launch was a legal and righteous exercise of self-defense and that those who try to, quote, violate the sovereignty of North Korea will face consequences. North Korean provocations are not only a threat to South Korea, but also a serious threat to liberal democracies around the globe. It's very important for South Korea, the U.S. and Japan to strengthen security cooperation, especially in Northeast Asia. Professor Kim added making good use of agreements made at the Camp David summit back in August would be essential. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. For the first time in over four years, top diplomats of Seoul, Tokyo and Beijing held trilateral talks in the port city of Busan this past weekend. They agreed to speed up efforts to resume their leaders' summit. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Yunji has more. Top diplomats of South Korea, Japan and China sat down for talks on Sunday and agreed to expedite preparations for the upcoming summit between their leaders. The three officials met here at the Nurimaru APEC House in Busan and reaffirmed their efforts to hold a trilateral summit at the earliest convenient time. Following the meeting that lasted for about an hour and a half, Seoul's Foreign Minister Park Jin explained that the three officials have decided to put trilateral cooperation back on track as soon as possible. We'll continue to work to make sure that the holding of the summit can be materialized in the near future. Park's Japanese and Chinese counterparts Yoko Kamikawa and Wang Yi also highlighted the importance of cooperation between the three countries. China will work together with South Korea and Japan to put the trilateral cooperation back on track and maintain a sound and steady development of trilateral relations. I hope today's foreign minister's meeting could become the opportunity for the three countries to resume trilateral cooperation. The last summit between the presidents of the three countries was held in December 2019 in China. It has not taken place for more than four years, largely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because of strained relations between Seoul and Tokyo. South Korea, as the chair of the upcoming summit, had hoped to hold a meeting before the end of this year. But the three countries have yet to agree on a specific date, and with a little more than a month remaining, arranging a meeting in 2023 is proving difficult. The Korean government is now reportedly aiming for it to take place sometime early next year. Meanwhile, ahead of the three-way talks, Park also held separate meetings with his Japanese and Chinese counterparts. While meeting the Chinese foreign minister, Park urged Beijing to play a constructive role in persuading North Korea to halt provocations. In response, Wang said China has always played and will continue to play the role needed to help stabilize the situation on the Korean Peninsula. During talks with Japan's foreign minister, the two sides discussed issues including a recent South Korean high court ruling that ordered the Japanese government to compensate victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery. Park reiterated Seoul's position that it respects the agreement made in 2015 with Tokyo, which says the two countries agree to finally and irreversibly resolve the issue. But Kamikawa called the court verdict extremely regrettable and urged South Korea to take appropriate measures. Peunji, Arirang News, Busan. President Yoon song yeol is back home, having concluded a week-long diplomatic agenda in Europe that involved a state visit to London and a support campaign in Paris. Correspondent Woo Soo-young has a recap and more. Seoul is building its clout as a trusted security partner in the Indo-Pacific region. That's according to experts following President Yoon Suk-yeol's visit to the United Kingdom and France last week. Emphasizing their shared values of freedom, human rights and the rule of law, Yoon's Downing Street Accord with UK leader Rishi Sunak showed an unprecedented level of security cooperation between the two sides, featuring deals on supply chains and the development of sensitive dual-use technologies co-developing artificial intelligence and quantum technologies to target North Korean missiles, as well as cybersecurity, which could act as a bridge to strengthen Seoul's links with the Five Eyes Intelligence Group, consisting of the UK, the United States, New Zealand, Australia and Canada, was also part of the deal. The willingness to share intelligence with uh, other countries, in this case South Korea, shows uh, a high level of trust. Uh, in the government of South Korea, also in the uh, intelligence gathering capabilities of South Korea. 
um, the military of South Korea as well, right? So in a sense, uh, it's proof that South Korea is considered to be a reliable partner by all these countries. Now, on top of that, these countries can gather intelligence that South Korea cannot, uh, for example, in the Middle East, uh, for example, in Russia. Uh, even if we look at uh, China, for example, they have different assets. Seoul also reaffirmed its value-based cooperation with Paris, agreeing to work together on AI and quantum technology as President Yoon and Macron exchanged views on North Korea's weapons collaboration with Russia and the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East, particularly as South Korea begins its two-year tenure as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council next year. South Korea has also been looking to multilateral platforms and like-minded partners to tackle global challenges that threaten peace, freedom and the rule of law in the international community. Uh, first of all, because we have seen uh, as a result of growing US-China competition, but also uh, the, the Trump administration being, being in office in the past, how South Korea has been looking at other potential partners, uh, not to replace the US, but really to, to complement what it gets uh, from the U.S., U.S.-Japan co cooperation uh, with with Korea is is very much driven by by specific security threats, and I think in the case of Europe, this is not uh, necessarily this, the case. Beyond security and economic interests, South Korea has also grown its capacity to contribute to global development. The country's bid to host the 2030 World Expo has been highlighted as the chance to foster global solidarity towards the goals of tackling inequality, climate change and emerging digital challenges that affect all societies. Presenting Busan as the world's solutions platform based on Korea's own transformation from a war-torn nation to a digital and cultural powerhouse, Yoon has held over 150 summits with 96 countries since its inauguration last year. Oh Seung, Arirang News. The Korea One team consisting of the government, business community and Busan City is making a last-minute push for the South Korean Port City's 2030 World Expo bid ahead of the vote by the Bureau International de Expositions in Paris. After arriving in the French capital on Sunday, Prime Minister Han dok su engaged in diplomatic activities to garner support for the 2030 Busan World Expo. On Monday, he plans to participate in various meetings, including luncheons and seminars with delegates from BIE member states to articulate Busan's vision and competence. Leaders of South Korean firms are also putting forth efforts with a strategy of meeting country representatives with a request for cooperation, persuading them to expand business opportunities through the Busan Expo. The Citizens Committee bid for the 2030 Busan World Expo is also boosting final promotional activities showcasing the city's competitiveness through events such as traditional hanbok experiences at Paris landmarks. Just one day left until the host of the World Expo 2030 is decided from among the three cities bidding for the honor, South Korea's Busan, Italy's Rome and Riyadh of Saudi Arabia. Tomorrow at the Bureau International de Expositions in Paris, contenders will give their fifth and final presentations. Ian Yi shares what to expect from the presentation specifically by Busan. The host city of the World Expo 2030 will be selected on Tuesday by the member states of the BIE at its 173rd General Assembly held in France. The meeting is scheduled to start at 9 in the morning with Expo progress reports. Then in the following order, the Republic of Korea's Busan, Italy's Rome and Saudi Arabia's Riyadh will give their fifth and final presentations on their expo projects for about 20 minutes each. Following this, the 182 member states will cast their sole votes for the World Expo 2030 host city. A candidate must get two-thirds of the votes cast to be selected outright. If no candidate achieves this target, there will be a second round of voting after the third-placed candidate is eliminated, and the winner of a simple majority will be selected. The voting is scheduled for 4 p.m. local time, midnight, on Wednesday in South Korea. Shortly after the voting is completed, the results will be revealed through the BIE's official account on X, formerly known as Twitter. Professor Yi shin -hwa from Korea University shared with Arirang News her hopeful speculations on what message the final presentation should convey at this stage of the bid. Although Riyadh's bid, backed with a budget of over 7 billion euros, will not be easy to beat, Professor Yi said that she hopes Busan's representatives will give inspiring speeches and share the city's hopeful energy with others.
I'm hoping that Busan will be able to show its convenient power to other candidates through its own success story in terms of economic, political and cultural development. Events like Expos act as a learning platform where countries share their unique potential and hold a national discourse. I believe Busan is a perfect place to be a bridge for other cities to share their success stories and vision. Amid growing interest in who will be on stage for the final presentation, internationally influential individuals are expected, with people anticipating mentions of BTS to Ban Ki-moon, the former UN Secretary General. Lee in -hee, Arirang News. South Korea needs to shift to a first mover strategy to get out of the current low rate of growth by putting out products to the market first. That's according to President Yoon song yeol on Monday as he hosted the Presidential Advisory Council on Science and Technology at his office for lunch. For this, Yoon said a research and development system also needs to be transformed in this direction. In addition, he said the country needs to be turned into a global hub for science and technology by hosting researchers from around the world. He also talked about the R&D budget, saying to ensure that research is supported in a timely manner, preliminary budget feasibility checks need to be simplified and to make budget execution more flexible. Turning to the war in the Middle East, 17 additional hostages have been released on the third day of the four-day ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Amid calls from the international community urging an extension of the pause, Israel appears open to prolonging the ceasefire. However, it emphasizes that a ground operation will resume at the end of the agreement. Shin ha -yong has more. As the temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas is set to end on Monday, the international community is urging an extension of the truce. According to AFP on Sunday, France has expressed a need for the ceasefire to continue until all hostages kidnapped by Hamas are released. During an interview with French media, French Foreign Minister Catherine Colonna urged for the release of the hostages from France and other countries, emphasizing the necessity for a further ceasefire. Earlier, U.S. President Biden also hoped a pause in the fighting would go on as long as hostages were getting released. That's my goal. That's our goal, to keep this pause going beyond tomorrow so that we can continue to see more hostages come out and surge more humanitarian relief into, into those in, who in need in Gaza. Egypt and the Netherlands have agreed on the need to extend a truce in the Gaza Strip and take urgent action to deliver humanitarian aid to the Palestinians. Other Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia and Jordan, have also emphasized the importance of extending the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. On the third day of hostage releases on Sunday, Hamas released 17 hostages, including 13 Israelis, in exchange for 39 Palestinians who had been held in Israeli detention centers. 33 of the Palestinians released by Israel were teenagers. The Associated Press reports that Hamas is willing to release more hostages in exchange for an extended ceasefire. Citing sources close to the Palestinian militant group, they are willing to release an additional 20 to 40 hostages. With 58 hostages being released in the first three days of the four-day temporary ceasefire, so far it's still short of the reported 240 people taken captive by Hamas on October 7. Meanwhile, in a video statement to President Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he is open to extending the current ceasefire, but once it is over, the military's ground operation will return in full force. Shin Ha-yong, Arirang News. Time now to take a look at what's been happening in the world of sports. For that, we have our sports editor, Paul Nee, joining us in the studio. Good evening, Paul. Hello there. Let's start with baseball. The KBO held its annual award ceremony this afternoon. Who won the major awards this year? Well, the MVP award went to Eric Fedi, and the Rookie of the Year award went to Moon Dong-ju. 
American Feddy was seen as the standout candidate for the MVP award and won 102 of the 111 votes. He is the first foreign pitcher to win what's called the Triple Crown in KBO to lead the league in wins, ERAs and strikeouts. This season he did just that by earning 20 wins with just six losses, 209 strikeouts and an ERA of 2.0. Meanwhile, 19-year-old Hanwha Eagles pitcher Moon Dongju, nicknamed Fireballer, who also won gold at the Asian Games this September, was named as Rookie of the Year. He pitched 23 games this season, winning eight, with an ERA of 3.72. In April, he became the first domestic player in KBO to throw a 160-kilometer-an-hour fastball. He's the first Hanwha player to win the award as well since a certain Yu Hyun Jin in 2006. Voting began back in October among the, the, the uh, Baseball Writers Association, but the ballot box had been kept sealed until today. Moving on to football and K-League, an instant return to the top division for Kim Chon sang -woo. Yes, and it was sealed in rather dramatic fashion as well. Kim Chon won the K-League 2 title on Sunday following a 1-0 win over Seoul Eland. But it was a result and one particular goal elsewhere that sealed it for them. Busan Ai Park began the day top of the table, needing to match Kim Chon's result to win the title. Kim Chon's lead began in the first half of their game, but Busan's not until the 70th minute of theirs at home to Chungbu Chongju. Heading into the dying embers, Fessin's goal for Busan looked to be enough for them to return to K League One. But a late, late goal from George Louise made it 1-1. At this point, Kim Chon's match had finished and their players and staff watched the Busan match finish nervously on their phones. The goal meant that Kim Chon moved top of the table by one point and were then presented with the league trophy. Heartbreak for Busan I Park, who will have to compete in the playoffs instead against the team that finishes 11th in K-League 1. They begin on Wednesday, first with Gyeongnam FC against Buchon FC 1995 in something of a semi-final and a rematch from last year. Both won on Sunday to seal their places. What a drama. Well, let's talk about ass swimming. A couple of South Korean swimmers have qualified the world championships in Doha. Yes, that's right. Kim Umin in the 800 meter freestyle and Kim Soyoung in the 200 meter individual medley. In Gimcheon on Saturday at a national team qualification event, Kim Umin finished first in the men's 800 meter freestyle with a time of 7 minutes 52.84 seconds. This was 0 0.27 seconds faster than the record. In addition, Kim Soyoung won the 200 meter individual medley with a time of 2 minutes 12.12 seconds, beating the record by 0.86 seconds. And because they both beat the records, they qualify for the World Championships in Doha next February. Meanwhile, Huang Sunu finished first in the men's 100 meter freestyle with a time of 48.57 seconds, but he fell short of the world aquatics record by just 0 0.06 of a second, meaning his place in Doha is in doubt. Mm. And finally, to tennis, um, to Davis Cup. A long-awaited win for Italy. Yes, 47 years in the making for Italy. In what is seen as the World Cup of tennis, a team event, Italy on Sunday in Malaga beat Australia two sets to zero. Yannick Sinner overcame Alex de Mignor 6-3, 6-love to seal it. This came after Matteo Arnaldi beat Alexic Popperin 7-5, 2-6, 6-4 to put Italy in the lead. It's Italy's second Davis Cup, but first since 1976. Australia were looking for a 29th. Sinner played a huge part in the semi-final win over Serbia the day before, saving three match points against Novak Djokovic to restore parity. But the team did then on went to earn a 2-1 win. All right, thanks for that. See you next week. Thank you. See you.
This is Park Seo-hui, the new weathercaster. I'm going to provide you with the latest weather updates from now on. Showers and snowflakes will continue to be in the forecast until tomorrow morning in most areas. Today's rainfall has brought frigid air nationwide. The sub-zero cold will continue throughout this whole week. With a sudden change to early winter, it's easy to come down with the cold or the flu. Please take care. For the coastlines of Gangwon-do and Gyeongsang-do provinces, dry weather advisories are issued. For eastern parts of the country, dry conditions are intensifying. With gusty winds, extra caution is necessary with anything that could start a fire. Icy cold morning temperatures in Seoul will start off at minus 3 degrees, Gwangju and Daegu 4 degrees Celsius. Daily highs in Seoul will return to positive range around 3 degrees, Chuncheon 3, Busan 11 degrees. The cold is expected to peak on Thursday with morning temperatures in Seoul dropping to minus 7 degrees. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session coming up.